Good afternoon. Welcome to Traders Workshop. My name is Tom Schneider. I'll be your host. Uh, and we have a very special guest today. And uh, before we do that, what we'll do is we'll go through our standard taking care of business kind of disclaimer. Um, futures options trading contains substantial risks, not for every investor. An investor could potentially lose all or more of their initial investment. We only want to use risk capital when we trade, risk capital being defined as something that we can afford to lose. It doesn't change our lifestyle, doesn't change our retirement horizon, doesn't introduce stress to our day. We know what happens when we have too much stress. I want to just point out that past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. And what we're doing today is to be used purely for educational purposes only. We're not giving any kind of recommendations or financial advice, and you should not take it as such. And so with that business out of the way, I'd like to welcome Brent Kochuba from Spot Gamma. Welcome, Brent. Thanks very much, Tom. How are you doing? Connecticut's about 45 minutes outside of New York City. Okay. Okay. So you're in Connecticut. And is that where you grew up? Is this where you're uh, located yeah. for a long time? Or Yeah. I grew up in uh, a town called Newtown, Connecticut, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, and then I uh, went to school at University of Connecticut. I lived and worked in New York City. I worked for uh, Credit Suisse and Bank of America and then a, uh, a market maker called Wolverine. I was a broker there for a bit. Um, so I've always been in the New York City general area, uh, and my family's here, my extended family, things like that. So it's a it's a great place to live, and and uh, happy to be here. So I, I'm just going to ask, Yankees fan? <laughs> yeah, I do like the Yankees. I'm not a not a huge baseball guy. I'm a big Patriots fan, so I'm kind of in that northern Fairfield County. You know, there's like a line of demarcation of whether you're like a Boston sort of fan or a New York fan. So I do watch the Yankees more than the Red Sox. I will say that. Okay. Okay. That's good. My daughter's a Yankees fan. So I um, understand that whole fandom there. So I'm um, just curious, how did you get into uh, the business? You mentioned you work at a couple of banks. Where did yeah. you start? So I started at a Bank of America and I was on what was called the program trading desk and basically did was basket trading. So if you think about big pension funds, uh, you know, 401k, every time you put money into your 401k, you're going to buy the S&P 500, right? In, a, in some type of a mutual fund. Well, the actual Fidelity or a pension fund has to buy all those individual little shares. So on the basket desk, you get these big orders where you'd have, say, you know, $50 million notional broken up across 100 different stocks or 500 different stocks or 1,000 different stocks. And so as a broker, I would kind of load these big spreadsheets up into a trading system and, and we would do what's called typically do VWAP orders. So you would you would uh, put these orders in the market and, and have them algorithmically trade and basically babysit those trades over the course of a day. So that was my sort of foray into uh, being a broker. You'd uh, basically trade for these large institutions. Um, and then from that, I segued a little bit into uh, the options market. And I started in the options market on the execution side. So this was sort of the birth around early 2000s of uh, algorithmic trading in options. So basically the, the, the idea of a sweep order was something that was very novel at this time. You know where you send out one order there's only like two or three exchanges at that time and we could electronically sweep and that was kind of a the innovation that we were uh selling or pursuing at the time so that's kind of how i got into equity trading and then options trading through there um and i was just a broker at credit swiss on the options desk uh, again focused a lot on market structure and those types of things um and then from there jumped to wolverine as a broker i believe wolverine is a, is a large options market maker uh, but i was on the brokerage side there uh, handling clients uh, uh, that were hedge funds, institutions, different things like that. Um, and then I had a client of mine wanted to start a fund. 
And so uh, he was a portfolio manager. He needed a trader, someone that kind of knew his way around setting up systems and order routing. And uh, so that was my foray kind of, or my jump from the sell side into the buy side. So um, I was his trader and, and did the execution and, and some basic strategies for him. I built a lot of uh, different engines to analyze the options market, to supplement a lot of his research and work. And through that, I uh, built a bunch of these interesting options models. And uh, I believe that the options, the options positioning and seeing the way that he would trade and seeing the way the market would move around these big options positions, big areas of open interest primarily, uh, seemed to have a control or have an impact on how the S&P 500 would move. Um, and so it was through that experience, about three or four years focused just on looking at that open interest every single day and how the market would move around that open interest. Uh, that was the experience and those are the models that kind of gave birth to Spot Gamma, uh, which started in January of 2020, kind of at the start of the pandemic. Oh, great. That's um, really interesting. So when we talk about, you know, the options market, you know, just for those of you, uh, those of us in our audience who might be new, you talk about um, open interest and, and, you know, where that open interest is, how does that relate you know, in the in the uh, options market, to what we can use, let's say, on the in the futures market or the yeah. index futures market specifically. Yeah, and and so we we focus on the options market here and and analyzing the options market for our subscribers at Spot Gamma. And one of our biggest sort of segments of clients are futures traders, guys that don't trade options at all. They trade uh, a lot of them trade obviously the E minis uh, and the Nasdaq futures, and. What is so interesting about the impact of options is that if you think about how large the S&P index is, obviously it's the world's kind of global stock benchmark, but there are huge options positions. So big put positions and big call positions. And most of those put and call positions are held by dealers or market makers. So anytime that you or I go out and we buy a call in the S&P 500 or even an individual stock, it's typically a bank or a market maker that is selling us that position, right? And they will hold these positions, big options positions on their balance sheet, just like a hedge fund would or, or you as an individual. And they need to hedge those options positions. And, and you don't necessarily need to know, obviously, the, all the Greeks and things, obviously, these terms like gammas and deltas, you may have heard, you know, along the way. But basically, what you need to know is that they have these big options positions on in the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ. Uh, and the way that they hedge themselves, the way that they protect themselves from risk is to typically buy or sell the underlying future, right? So if I have a big S&P 500 options portfolio, every day I'm going to come in and I'm going to buy or sell futures based on how the market is moving around and what my risk portfolio like, looks like. And so you can imagine that as the options position gets bigger or as the options positions gets more concentrated around certain levels, the size of the hedging flow increases, right? And then during times of where options expire, once a month there's an options expiration, we actually have one on Friday, there will be big shifts in these options positions. And we can see that those, what the, we can see the size of the options that are going to uh, expire. And then we can predict how those hedging flows, aka the buying and selling of futures, uh, may shift as a result. Right. So um, looking, you know, with this information, where, where do you start in terms of viewing that on a chart. So you, you've got this information, especially with this week with option expiry, how might you use that using, let's say looking at the E-mini today um, with the options expiry coming up this uh, the end of the week, what what are you looking at with the information that you're you're getting from, from the options uh, market? Yeah, so there are, there are two, key takeaways from what we do and, and we write a daily note every morning that analyzes the options market in depth and, and sort of try to assign an edge or key support and resistance lines so the, the the two key elements are support and resistance lines which anyone who's trading futures understands what that is and then the second one are volatility estimates so how much might the market move today that's another key element i think a lot of people in futures trading especially if you're new you don't think about that right um, do you try to, if you're a swing trader or you're scalping, right, do you want to scalp for five or 10 handles today or should you try for something bigger, 50 handles, right, or 100 handles in really crazy markets? And so our volatility estimates, again, set up those support and resistance lines as well as offer a volatility estimate. 
Um, and, and basically, those are the two key elements. We have a lot of futures traders who may or may not read our note on a daily basis. A, a lot of them do, but a lot of them want to see the, the key levels loaded up into their system every day. So they know, hey, this is how the options market might impact the futures market. Um, Today is a very interesting example because we had a big lift in futures this morning and, and into the afternoon. And if you look around at the news, there's really not much happening, right? There's not anything material. And a lot of times people will sort of scramble to assign a narrative to why the market is up or down. And what's so interesting about today's lift is that there's a big VIX expiration tomorrow. And so the VIX, for those of you who aren't too familiar with what the VIX actually is, the VIX is actually calculated from the price of S&P 500 options. So the, the link between the VIX and the S&P is very, very tight. It's very, very close. And so with this VIX expiration, uh, there are a lot of VIX puts and calls that are expiring today. And that can lead to uh, actually movement in the S&P 500 as traders adjust their VIX positions. And so that's something that's happening today. Those positions uh, will expire officially tomorrow at 9 a.m. And we have documented cases of where the market will rally or decline into VIX expirations and then how the market responds after those events. And so if you're not aware of the options market, you may be sort of scratching your head here and saying, I don't understand why the market's rallying and not necessarily having a, a valid data point here to say, OK, now I understand. Now I can look at the, the futures market here through the options lens. Right. And make some sense out of movement. Yeah, that's that's great, great information. Jim and I. Uh, this morning, looking looking at the markets, uh, we looked at the uh, after hours. Of course, we saw some movement in the European market, but why does that continue through in in the U.S. market when there's no real meaningful reports? And you know, we think the big uh, the big event th today is the Fed's um, Powell speaking at two. Yep. But what, why is it moving ahead of that? Right. And exactly. so you know, this this is a great explanation. Is it something you can show? on an intraday chart right now or is that yeah, absolutely um, and i have uh i have the uh, ninja chart here queued up and i can kind of walk through the way that we're looking at the market so this is zoomed right. out a little bit here and if you'll note there are these yellow lines on the screen and, and they're a little bunched here and when i zoom in they'll clean up obviously but the yellow lines are actually imported every day from our system so if you're a spot game subscriber you get a link uh, and there's a little applet you load it into ninja trader and every morning at 3 a.m we rerun our levels and we update those levels on your screen so you'll see how the market can interact with these lines. But I started with this zoomed out view because I wanted to highlight this line right here. And I can, I believe I can just annotate, it might be a little bit easier. So, um, so this line right here, oh, I'm moving the chart around. So I won't annotate, sorry. <laughs> so this sure. line right here was VIX expiration back on April 20th. And April 20th was just a very strange day. Actually, April 19th is a very strange day. It was very similar today in that there was Powell speaking and he basically said, you know, we're not backing down from hiking. Uh, and the market expectations didn't change around hiking. In fact, he came off, I believe, slightly hawkish. And so the point was there wasn't a great uh, reason to say, why did the market rally basically 100 handles? And that's what happened. You can see there was a low here and the next day the market popped. And the VIX at this point drove sharply lower. And remember I mentioned earlier that the VIX settlement is 9 a.m. on Wednesday. Well, the VIX dropped from mid to high 20s and it dropped straight down to, to at 9 a.m. on Wednesday, it closed exactly at 20. So what happens is, and I'll show a different chart of that. What happens is traders start to sell volatility, right? They start to sell VIX. You can trade VIX futures. You could buy puts on the VIX options. Uh, but basically what happens is when you start to sell volatility, Right, that allows traders to buy. Uh, that that allows hedgers to buy the market. They buy the S and P futures, and we get into this link. We have a lot of these videos on our YouTube channel. I know this might be slightly over some people's heads, but just look at the sort of the backstory here. Right, again, the VIX expiry is right here. Uh, you get this big pop in the market the day before. So the, the market rallied sharply from 4,400 all the way up to 4,500. Again, there was no narrative here. There was no no one could point to anything that was significantly. Uh, occurring in the market around this time. And in fact, Powell, again, spoke right at this, again, same time frame as, as today, right? Powell speaking today, we have VIX expiration tomorrow. And then this big red bar here was stock expiration on Friday. So we had this big strange gap in the market, the market due to VIX expiration, we believe, the market pinned that level and then we gapped back down lower. And, and we said in our subscriber note this morning, it's a very, very similar setup. In fact, 
This blue line here is Tuesday, right? So that's what this blue line is. That's Tuesday. Again, Powell speaking today, as you mentioned before. We don't know what he's going to say. We suspect he's not really going to say much uh, material, right? I have much material to say. And so now we have, in two days' time, another big stock expiration. And so we think the setup is, is eerily similar to, to that event. And, and basically what happens around these big expirations, just to kind of dig into the mechanics a little bit, is, uh, Tom, if, if I was a dealer and you bought a put from me, right, um, I would be short a put option. So if the market goes down, I'm going to lose a lot of money, for those of you who are familiar with puts, right, because the market's going down and I'm short a put option. So the way that I would hedge myself is I would sell uh, futures against that put option. So if the market goes down, my short put position is going to lose me money, but I'm going to offset that by being short futures, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So expiration is this Friday. And so if my put option that I'm short expires on Friday, every day that the market shifts towards Friday, my put decays in value a little bit, right? My put's going to lose some value. Or if the market rallies up, obviously that's going to, that's going to do well for me because I'm short that put. So as time, time decay occurs, my put loses value and or if the market rises, my put loses value. So what that essentially means is that if I originally needed, let's say just for round numbers, I needed 10 futures short to hedge myself on, let's say Monday we did the trade, right? On Tuesday, I only need eight futures. On Wednesday, I only need five futures. And on Thursday, I only need one future. So I'm buying back futures slowly over the whole week, right? As, as the market goes up and as time passes. So you can imagine that if dealers have tens of thousands of put positions on, hundreds of thousands of put positions on, you could see how that flow, the change in implied volatility, i.e. when the VIX drops or as time passes on, how that, that flow could offer, that hedging flow could offer sort of a, a bounce in the market. So that's, that's what we view as kind of occurring right now. Um, and if I zoom in just slightly, you'll see some of the, uh, you'll note that one kind of key thing here. I'm going to try to adjust my screen a little bit. Our levels at the moment, so this morning we came in and we had a 1.2% volatility estimate for the day. And if you look at where the big options positions are, there's huge gaps on either side of the market. And this typically doesn't happen. Usually we'll have a level, a significant level, every kind of 25 to 50 handles. But you'll note in here that we have no options based positions or resistance or support anywhere from 400 all the way up to 4100. I should pause real quick and note, you'll see here this number 4100, that is the SPX level. So we automatically adjust the level for the e-mini futures equivalent okay so that's why you see the label actually at 4094 because there's roughly a six handle difference you know between where the spx index is trading in the in this uh uh future so at any rate we're looking for the market today to find support or resistance at one of these two major levels so we're gonna have powell come in we had this kind of unique overnight rally powell's gonna come in today and say whatever he may or may not say and that we think will shift the market either up to this 4100 level for tomorrow or down to the 4000 level for tomorrow. And that's going to feed into this uh, rather large options expiration on Friday. Got it. Now, um, Brent, I had a question. You mentioned um, how these big institutions would hedge their uh, options position with futures. You mentioned selling futures and then buying them back up as expiration comes along. Is this because we're in, um, you know, certainly Jim and I have talked about this. Our bias right now overall is somewhat bearish. Um, is the opposite true, of course, in a, in, if your bias was bullish, whereas um, the hedging would reverse, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And I, I want to flip to one of our, uh, our, our kind of member charts here. Um, and what I wanted to show in this in this chart was this breakdown, now this is the spiders. And, and one thing I want to mention to, to people uh, who trade futures, there is a massive options market in the spiders as well. So obviously the spiders, SPY, is linked to the SPX, which is linked to the future. So you got to pay attention to sort of the entire, I call it the S&P 500 options complex because they all sort of uh, matter. But to your sort of point here, we have this chart. Um, let me show this. It, it's a... Uh, and I don't want to get too technical on, on some of your users here, but basically what this, this chart here shows you, the green line, is the size essentially of the hedging position uh, in the market. And, and what that essentially means is when this number is down the, at the low, like it is, it means that there are very large put positions in the market. And you'll note that the current put position in the market is the same size as in March of 2020, and then also back to 2018. So what we tell people is, look, 
we're at kind of a lower bound, right? Or a max put position, we call it, which simply tells you that big funds, you know, think Bridgewaters of the world and, and pension funds and the big players, they have massive hedges on and those hedges are deep in the money, meaning that they bought those puts to typically buy them every quarter. And as the market goes down, those puts grow in value. So, th so that's what this is showing you. Essentially another view of, look, this is a max put positioning. So it's a very, in a way, a very bearish put positioning. But as we talked about before, when those puts expire, or when those puts roll off, as we like to say, that means that dealers can maybe buy back some futures, right? They can, and, and that can bring a positioning bounce, we like to call it. So you're a technical analyst. There's fundamental you know, analysis as well. And we call ourselves kind of positional analysis. Yes, you know, it's a bearish market. You were saying that we're in this sort of trend channel down before. And, and I, don't, I look 30 days out max, right? Because that's typically where options are positioned. And in my 30-day window, I say, look, there's a catalyst we started talking about this on Monday. There's a catalyst just today into Friday, maybe Monday for a bounce here because of positioning. And if anything, what will happen is with expiration, you'll get this line here, this max put position. This line will bounce higher simply because a bunch of puts are going to expire. So that leads this max position, max put position some to relieve some, right? There's some relief there. Um, and when you have a market that's very well hedged and puts expire, well, then the market is not quite as well hedged, right? So we, so we can maybe shift lower than our low last week because there's fewer puts in the market. So another way to kind of look at that is if you look at this chart I started with here in the spiders, the way that this is plotted, and again, I don't want to get too technical here, but if it's a positive bar, the, this is gamma notional. So just think about as, as a weighted average, right, of, of size for calls. So each one of these, this is all strikes, right? So at the 400 strike, there's a fair amount of calls you can see by this black line. And then there's a few calls ahead. But when you compare that to the put positions, the puts are these negative bars. The put positions are much, much bigger, right? Again, just think of these right. as weighted average size of calls on the top and puts at the bottom. So you can see there's no calls below 400, obviously, or 4,000 in the, in the S&P. Uh, but there are these big put positions that exist all the way down to 3,700, roughly, in the SPX and the SPY. And so what that is, again, telling us is that all the traders are piled into puts right now. The shaded gray area is today's expiration. So we're going to get a little bit of chunky expiration off over the next few days. But basically what we're saying is this is a market that's dominated by puts. And so as puts expire, we'll get sort of a recovery, short cover rally. Uh, but there's no appetite for call position. So whether you want to think of that as a sentiment thing, no one wants calls because they're not ready for a rally. Um, or again, a positioning exercise. Either way, it, it is a, it's quite a bearish uh, a situation. Right. So... Um... Thank you for that. That's that's really informative. I do want to encourage people to drop some questions in the chat if you have questions for Brent. Um, so you know, kind of to sum it up, what what it sounds like, Brent, you're saying is the over uh, the the there's a huge put um, uh, volume. There's huge put volume in the in the markets, though the expirations could result in a in a slight bullish uh, bounce, if you will, dead due to expiration. <laughs> yeah, dead count bounce, right? We're in a downward trend and we have this, this you know, possibly we could see with, with uh, uh, options expiration uh, coming this week, um, we could see that bounce, but still the, the, the puts, the, the amount of puts to cause the put call ratio, if you will, um, that still suggests we might be in a, in a bearish, bearish trend, at least right now. Right. That's the, the outlook right now. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. And, and one of the things that I wanted to, to sort of, you know, if people want a little bit of evidence here. And I, I don't know if I can zoom back this far in my configuration here, so I apologize. But if you were to look at a chart and we have this posted on our, on our site. Um, but if you look at a chart going back in time of the um, key lows in the market, right, historically, um, the, the low in the market in March of 2020, this is the pandemic crash, right? Where right. we're just firing brimstone, right? The low in the S&P was the Monday after the quarterly options expiration. So the, the March, uh, the third Friday of March is always a very big expiration. Um, the low in the S&P 500 was the day after that expiration. December of 2018, if you recall back again, another really tough time in the market. It was the Christmas Eve day that Mnuchin calls the banks and people say, what's going on? That was the low in the market. That is the day after a very large December expiration. This past March, uh, March 2022, we actually got a rally slightly before because we had the FOMC. But again, it was tied right to that options expiration. 
there was another huge uh, crash. If you remember, at, to start this year, this is the January time frame we're looking at. January, the third Friday of, of January, was a massive options expiration, and the low was, again, the, the Monday after uh, OPEX. So you can go back and look at a chart, and you'll be amazed at how many times a, a significant low is uh, put in on the days of expiration. So March is a, is a pretty good size expiration. We look at roughly 25 to 30% of the options position is going to expire um, on a gamma weighted basis again for this Friday and then June was the other thing we wanted to flag June is a huge expiration it's a massive options expiration and you know if we happen to really sell off hard into that June OPEX our view is like you want to look for a, a sharp rally in and around that June OPEX oftentimes the Monday after just as a function of positioning now we don't know how the market's going to react obviously at this moment into that June but as traders just flag that date right write that date down in your head and say okay look options market may really offer some impact around this date i want to look at that and configure that into my trading plan right yeah and and so um you know we've been focusing on the s p um you know other ind indices you look at generally um yeah uh so we spend a lot of time looking at the uh the nasdaq as well and then of course the russell and then the vix futures complex we also analyze uh, over 3,500 different stocks, so Teslas and, and basically all the other individual stocks that you can imagine. But if we just flip over to the to the Nasdaq here, one of the things that you can see is if I bring up, we have this little pop-up window. Uh, the the options complex in the NDX index options, it's not very large. We we pay very little attention to that, so we watch the queues very closely. Um, and so if you're trading the NASDAQ, we think you need to be aware of how the Qs are trading. Many of you probably already are, uh, but the 300 level in NASDAQ and the Qs is very, very large level. Um, and I want to show a different chart actually that, that maybe helps to, to view that slightly different. Um, and Brent, this is all available as part of your um, service to your clients, right? This is something that they would see. They would be able to log in and see that. That's exactly right. That's exactly yeah. right. Um, so this is part of our, our membership portal here, basically. But we, we showed you the chart just previously in the S&P 500 of the 400 level in the spiders and the 4000 level in the um, in the S&P 500 as major levels. Well, that's the same thing again in, in NASDAQ. If you look at this 300 level again, small call positions above and and just massive put positions here at the 300 level. And, and so 30 percent of this position particularly this giant strike you see here is going to go away on Friday. And so, you know, that's going to change hedging flows, right? That's going to adjust, uh, lead people to adjust, uh, head, uh, dealers to adjust how they're going to hedge. And that could break us out of ranges, right? That could cause uh, upside volatility, downside volatility. You know, it, it's a little dependent on how we're going to trade into Friday. Uh, but basically the fact that all these positions are expiring are a, is a position led catalyst to, for, for movement. Um, so 300 in the queues is what you're watching. And as and NASDAQ futures get, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, as the queues move around 300, you want to pay attention to those NASDAQ futures. Great, great. Um, Brent, real quick, we have a question uh, from a viewer, M.A. Uh, Credit Suisse, did you work there when XIV collapsed? Can you explain, explain that collapse? Oh, sorry about that. I, uh, I <laughs> coughed before so I meet myself. Uh, so I was not a credit Swiss during the XIV collapse. I was actually at Wolverine. And, and what was so fascinating about that collapse is in 2017, if you guys traded through that, I don't know how you may remember this, Tom. I'm sure you do. The amount of volatility in the market in 2017 was the lowest volatility, I think, possibly ever. It was anemic and it was so dull. <laughs> and everybody would short... Uh, the volatility basically through these ETPs like uh, XIV, right? Today, those are VXX is still around in, in UVXY, obviously. And so what happens is uh, that obviously as realized volatility, that's how much the market is moving, starts to just bleed out and move towards zero. I mean, it, you know, if, the, if it was a body, you'd think it was dead, right? Because there's just no movement. And so what ends up happening is people still want to try to milk volatility premium we call it out of the market so people start selling volatility but they're getting a smaller incremental return you know as they do that right because volatility is just flatlining it's not like today where there's huge uh, movement in the markets and so what happened is in the start of january we actually got a little bit of market movement 
And people took that as an opportunity to sell volatility. They wanted to get into the XIV because they said, great, we haven't had an opportunity to short volatility in over a year. This is an awesome opportunity for me, apparently, or they thought this, uh, to short volatility. Because again, um, you got this relatively high VIX spike. And so everybody was short and the VIX continued to go higher. And there were these basically... Uh, if you looked at the prospectus of XIV, there are these, uh, they call them uh, events. I forget the exact term, but there, there are these events basically that the VIX moves, I believe it was more than 30% in one day. It's a termination event for the XIV. Basically, the XIV would blow up. And a lot of sophisticated traders knew this. They knew how to model it. Um, and heading into VIX expiration, again, third Friday uh, of the month in uh, January, we got that big VIX pop. It blew up all of these positions. We had a few weeks of volatility, and then roughly a month later, you know, it was like nothing had ever happened in the S&P 500. But basically what that was is, again, a positioning thing, right? Everyone was positioned short. People kept piling on, and that position just got foisted or, or, or pushed against them. Um, so there are some similar volatility products here now. What's kind of curious thing in, in this market is that a lot of people may note that the VIX has not taken out the high. Like A lot of people are wondering, why is this? Why hasn't the VIX exceeded its high? Incidentally, the VIX high is on 224, which is the day of the Ukrainian invasion. Uh, it did put an intraday high just under 38. And I think in the last week, even though the S&P is a good 200 points lower or 150 points lower uh, than on end of February, the VIX is, has peaked out 34. And we think a lot of that is because of this max put positioning. Dealers are well hedged. There's no real reason to bring VIX up higher. Plus, when you look at this concept of realized volatility, uh, and I have a chart of that actually, realized volatility is quite high. The market is moving a lot. And so uh, if, I, if I bring up this chart, I'll give you an example of that. Um, and so the VIX at 30 is somewhat fair value based on how much the market is actually moving. In other words, the VIX is, yes, the VIX is quote high, but if you look at how much the market's actually moving, there's not much of a premium there. In other words, if we look at this realized volatility chart here, you can see that just a few days ago, we were having a realized volatility basically of 28, right? So if you compare that to the VIX of 27, 28, well, those two are fairly equal. Um, this is the, the green line is what I'm talking about here. So realized volatility of 28 uh, tells us that um, a VIX, again, of 30 is roughly fair value. You can you just kind of compare those two directly. Uh, so this is, again, a kind of interesting moment where back then no one thought the VIX would spike. It did. Here, it's sort of almost a similar thing. People are thinking, look, the VIX isn't going to spike, but the difference is we're at a low uh, in the market as opposed to something of a high as we're back during the, the XIV saga. Great. Um, you know, I just want to ask, uh, go over another question real quick or a comment. Um, Andrew Morris comments that it's kind of like the commitment of traders with the biggest numbers repping the big institutions. Um, looking, going back to your uh, previous chart where you were, looking at the uh, call versus put uh, um, yeah. uh, volume, right? So, you know, we think of commitment of traders, futures, you know, the information that's put out for, um, you know, what the interest is essentially, what 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 the institutions and, and non-institutions have committed to, to, to trade, you know, how does that relate or, or is that a good um, uh, comparison? Yeah, it's a, it's a very similar comparison in that that's a positional exercise. Um, I, I think what's a little bit different here is that we can forecast uh, how dealers should adjust their positions, how market makers should adjust their positions uh, based on some fairly simple options models like Black-Scholes. So we can, options market makers, as we all know, they're in the business of collecting a small VIG, right, a spread on every single trade. They're not in the business of directional trading. Maybe they lean one way or another occasionally, but really their business is, again, doing a lot of trades, capturing small spread, and not taking directional risk. And so we can estimate how much directional risk they have and how much futures they need to buy or sell. Um, and then also, how is their position going to change, right? Everyday people are, cha are trading, so open interest adjusts. <clears throat> but we also know, hey, here's a big expiration, and these contracts have to go away, right? Friday, we know exactly how many contracts have to go away. Excuse me, and we can... Uh, predict or estimate the the way that hedging flows will change. 
Another thing is with volatility, if, if the VIX, i.e. implied volatility, drops or, or jumps, right, how will hedging have to change? And we can predict all of those things. And so the key is, look, at, on the margin, on, a, on an average day, there's one or two key important levels. Um, we're, we're not here trying to say that the options market controls every move every day of, of everything that trades, right? But there are these times where you want to sort of sit up and go, okay, here's where I know the options market should come into play, a la tomorrow, at 4,000 uh, in the S&P because of how big this position is. Friday, we have this big options expiration. And so those are the moments you kind of say, okay, what is the options market? How is that going to impact, you know, what's happening here? So, so Brent, just curious, you know, we've, it's an interesting week. We've been in interesting times, but it's really interesting because we do have the expiration this week. What happens after? I mean, and I'm not talking immediately after, you know, Monday, but I'm talking, the three weeks that we're not looking at at op options expiration coming up, is it is it a similar uh, look? Do we we have we definitely have levels, but um, are they as interesting? I guess is 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 insightful. Yeah. Yeah, and in this market, what we've been seeing is that there are one of the dynamics that's changed in this options market now is that there is now an options expiration every single day of the week for the S&P 500. And that's a brand new thing. They just added Thursday expiration in the S&P 500. Uh, this will be the first Thursday expiration. So the, the exchanges continue to add these expirations and a lot of traders in the options market like to come in and they like to trade options that expire the same day. They think that they have an edge there. Um, so there's a very short term dynamic that is rapid and changes quite a bit. And that's kind of overlaid over where the big players are. So I mentioned before how big the, the June timeframe is. And, and if you look at this table here, this is an estimate of uh, how much is set to expire from a, a delta and gamma perspective. And, and basically, again, just, just consider these as weightings, right? Um, you don't really want to look at open interest because some open interest could be so far away from where the market is trading that it, that it doesn't really have an impact. But you can see here that... Um, we have a very 20% of the market right now in the S&P, 20% of the options business is set to expire on, on May. Uh, but if we forward just a little bit here to June, you can see that this is the June expiration I was talking about before. This Delta number is a massive number. It's, it's really, really big. And that's where we're talking about it being impactful. So the core options positions, the big boys, they're not going to change their position at all until June, right? In June, their contracts expire, and they and they typically will systematically roll out to the next quarter. So we know what those guys generally do. We know how those positions line up. And so our forecast will look at where these are positioned, combine that with where the short-term traders are doing, um, and that will oftentimes have a have a nice impact on the way that the, the market is trading. Um, right now, again, because the VIX is so high, implied volatility is so high, we look at a lot of how is volatility moving. As you know, if you own a put option, even if the market – price doesn't change, but volatility spikes, your put option makes a lot of money, right? So that volatility component, implied volatility component, very important to monitor that. So those are changing rapidly all day, uh, and those affect the daily movement of futures. So what we basically end up with, and, and as we were sort of showing our chart before here, um, is that we size these levels. You'll see a note here, there's an L1, L2, L3, L4, et cetera. That's level one, that's our biggest level. Uh, level two is our smallest, or, or excuse me, level five is our smallest level. Um, and all of these levels sort of represent something interesting in the market. And the way that they move represents uh, changes in positions and adjustments in positions. And so you can take this into your trading plan. There are oftentimes a lot of technical indicators or, or technical areas that will line up with options levels. And a lot of traders who, who are, uh, who, who track different forms of technical analysis, Fibonacci's and, and, and channels and different things like that. Love to see the, the, uh, when an options level overlays with one of their key technical levels. Um, they'll find that to be very powerful. Um, so you can overlap and overline a lot of these things. So we'll see some of these levels will change rapidly intraday, but the kind of the biggest levels like this L3 here, or L1, they'll, they'll stay until an options expiration and then they'll, and then they'll sort of shift. So, um, that's it. You know, we as a technical analyst, I definitely like to see when my indicators line up with my levels line up when they're coincident with other levels um, matching, you know, VWAP matches, uh, pivots, Fibonacci's. Certainly, I can see where they would be beneficial here. Um, looking at the chart today, uh, this is the E-mini today, including um, 
yesterday's session yep right so now these levels that you have up here they're they're renewed every day right so they're recalculated right. and um every day so looking at yesterday's data doesn't make make it isn't that interesting just because it didn't exist yet yesterday but going forward we see that um you know will we see these bands and, and i'm you know obviously we can't we can't say what for sure would happen but in your experience with these bands as we get closer to expiration do they get closer to the price data you know understanding that anything can happen and, and price can move them, you know the market can move the way it does but do they tighten up i guess is what i'm what i'm asking about or yeah um, what's your experience there yeah, and kind of at the at the at the top of our discussion here, I mentioned that the the bands are very wide. It's 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 somewhat rare to have the bands so wide. Um, and I, and there's that the chart of the positioning where calls on top and puts are on bottom. If you look at the S and P, there's a lot of gaps between those bars. Uh, oftentimes, particularly in a call heavy market where low volatility, you'll see levels that'll be only five or ten handles apart. Uh, but mm -hmm. yesterday, we've been looking at this four thousand level. Obviously, again, it was a huge. Uh, set of bars if you remember that chart that we were looking at before and that level's been there for some time it's been there for months and so as the market sort of tests that it's a support and resistance line and, and that's kind of what we got yeah we, we tested a little bit here but but basically the market held that level and then you come into again the VIX expiration and our levels are very wide again our forecast for today was a 1.2 percent uh, volatility estimate for the day um, so that's a that's a pretty big volatility estimate. If you look at what the VIX is pricing, the VIX is pricing somewhere between you know one roughly 1.7 percent S and P move. So the options market is pricing a big move. We're pricing a big move, and then our levels are really spread out in a unique way. Um, so we think what's going to happen today is Powell is going to come in. The market is going to perceive that as as bullish or bearish. I don't know. However, the market reacts, it reacts, but we're going to look for it to sort of immediately shift to one of these two big options levels. And that's because, again, the strength of the VIX expiration and the options market, uh, the options expiration on Friday uh, leads to either, you know, puts decaying and, and dealers can maybe buy some futures and that will lift us up and, and pin us into this 4100 area. Or we'll have the situation where the market didn't like what Powell had to say. And then we think this 4000 level will become a really uh, a level that's tested quickly. And it has a lot of support. Those are my forecasts. Uh, not trading advice again, uh, but just sort of how we're viewing the market. Oh, that's great. That's really interesting. Um, you know, we have one more comment uh, from Chris Sauger. Um, we were talking about June earlier. In, in June, big options expiration month. Uh, Chris mentions also that China is due to come out of the pandemic, uh, out of the lockdown due to the pandemic, I should say, um, June 1st. So, you know, is that is that something that might um, we might see a move before that? You know, or, or could we see that? Uh, could the options market tell us something about that if they're anticipating that, or or when it happens? Is that something that might move that? Yeah. So what we would look for in the options market is, uh, you know, obviously there's there's macro flows that will come into the market anytime you have a situation where you know there's positive news out of China or or, or whatever it may be. And so what we would look for from the options market is uh, people shifting into call positions. Right now, there's very little appetite for call positions. And that goes for not only index products, but also individual stocks. Uh, our gauge, we, we monitor how, how big the call and put positions are in, again, 3,500 in stocks. But if you just look at the stocks in the S&P 500, the call position is, is as low as it's been going back you know, pre-pandemic, basically pre-March of 2020, while the put positions are very high. So, Again, nobody's looking at calls right now. Uh, nobody's positioned for that upside. So that can be a real gotcha if you get a, a positive macro catalyst. Uh, you could see a real uh, scramble for a short cover. And in that case, uh, the positions, the options positions would change quite a bit. But what, what our analysis would help you view is how much fuel is there from uh, the volatility coming down, right? From implied volatility dropping. So if the VIX goes to 20, what should you expect? Or what can you anticipate in the market? Uh, if all these puts certainly are burned because nobody wants to be short anymore, how much volatility could you expect in the market? Um, and, and you could very easily get, we think, a, a move with a positive macro position up into the 4,300 area, uh, which is a, a major level. It's been a major level for us for a while. Um, and that's because of a dynamic that's, that's probably a little too nuanced to explain at this, at this moment. Uh, but if anyone wants to send us an email or tweet, you know, be happy to, to dig into that. Well, that, yeah, that's a great answer. Thank you, Brent. And 
Um, we're running up against time, so I'd like to give you, um, you know, the opportunity to show, you know, uh, what what Spot Gamma looks like as far as, uh, you know, some 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 way somebody can reach out to Spot Gamma. Um, Absolutely. Where do they find you? Right. Absolutely. So you can find us at spotgamma.com. I'm at Spot Gamma on Twitter. Uh, we have a big YouTube channel where we, we're constantly doing videos, uh, educational videos. A lot of them are focused on the futures market, how you can use our levels to, to supplement some of your futures trading. Um, we do have the special code for Ninja Trader uh, users on this webinar. So if you go to our, our site, if you go to uh, subscribe now, there's a coupon spot. You pop in Ninja 15, we'll give you half off the first month. Uh, so as a thank you for all watching here. Uh, but basically what you get with Spot Game is you get the daily levels um, that we showed you that push out to Ninja Trader. We write two daily notes, uh, a morning note around 7 a.m. Eastern time. That's what This is what the today's note looks like. And then uh, there's another one that comes out after the close where we just sort of recap the, the trading action. There's tons of different tables. We have a new real-time indicator in the market. Uh, it's called Hero. So if you uh, want to check that out, basically that shows you how the intraday options flows are moving around. Um, and so that's a brand new brand new feature. If you want to try that, you can go to Scribe now and go to the Alpha membership, and that will give you access to our real-time data tools um, along, uh, along with our daily notes and, and key levels. Well, that's great. Thanks, Brent. Uh, really appreciate you coming on and sharing your knowledge with us. Um, Traders Workshop, we're here to help new and uh, uh, veteran traders and give you uh, ideas that you might not know about. We partner with um, providers in the Ninja ecosystem. And Brent, we appreciate you being one of the, the first uh, providers that we are partnering with, and we hope to see you soon again real quick. Thanks so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. And if I could plug one more thing, well, we were just sure. in a documentary called Diamond Hands. It was on MSNBC on Sunday. You can find it streaming on Peacock now. Uh, it's about, uh, it follows a couple of the characters that were involved for maybe lack of a better term uh, in the GameStop saga and covers some really interesting uh, angles of that. It's, it's, it's a fun movie to watch as well. So uh, please, please check that out. Uh, again, it's on Peacock streaming now. Oh, that's great. That's really good stuff. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, say thank you to everybody who joined. Thanks who, to those people who contributed and um, hope you found this informational and valuable. Uh, we certainly did, and uh, like to again thank, extend thanks to Brent. Uh, Traders Workshop, it's a new show here at Ninja Trader. It comes to you uh, live noon uh, every Tuesday, noon Eastern, and we will have the replay available on our YouTube channel. So with that, I'd like to say um, thank you and have a great trading day. Thanks so much, Tom. Thanks, Brent. Mm -hmm.